Now, the gifts, I say, must be differentiated from natural gifts. The spiritual gift is, 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 is something that is given to a man. We've all got certain natural gifts. But the spiritual gift, which any one of us may possess, is something entirely different from that. It is a gift that is given directly to us by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the first point to hold in our minds, therefore. That it is something separate from and distinct from natural gifts. Let us go further and say this. It doesn't even mean the heightening of a natural gift. Now, some people have fallen into that error. They have thought that what a spiritual gift really means is that a man's natural gift taken hold of by the Holy Spirit is heightened or made more vivid, and that that is, therefore, a spiritual gift. Well, that again, as I understand this teaching, and I think it's commonly accepted teaching, that is not uh, what the scripture would have us believe. It is something separate from, something new, something uh, which is different. Now, here is a definition that's given in a well-known uh, Greek lexicon, which I think up to a point is helpful. Uh, it, it, the gift is described as extraordinary powers distinguishing certain Christians and enabling them to serve the Church of Christ, the reception of which is due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls by the Holy Spirit. That's all right. It's, it's, it's putting it uh, quite clearly. Well, now, the great thing I say to remember here is that it is something new and special and different which is given to us by the Holy Spirit directly. They are called the charismata, and people talk about these charismatic gifts. And if you use such a term as that, you mean by that that it isn't a natural gift, but it's something new, over and above, direct from the Spirit uh, which is given. That's the first comment. Then uh, the second comment, and a very important one, is this that these gifts are bestowed upon us by the Holy Spirit in a sovereign manner. The sovereignty of the Spirit in the giving of these gifts is emphasized very clearly in this chapter. Listen to verse 11, for instance. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, as he will, it is he who decides, and not us. He decides to whom to give the gift. He decides what particular gift to give to this particular person. And I wonder whether we are going too far when we say this, that the idea of the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in the dispensing of these gifts carries implicitly not only the which and the to whom, but also the when that it is the prerogative of the Holy Spirit in his sovereign power as one of the three persons in the blessed Holy Spirit, not only, I say, to decide what person and what gift, but when to give particular gifts, to withhold them if he chooses, to give them if he chooses. He is Lord, he is sovereign in this respect. And therefore, I say that it is very important to bear that in mind. The principle, then, I say, is that the Holy Spirit is absolutely sovereign in this matter, and he decides. It's brought out clearly in verse 11. But the very term which is used, beginning, say, at verse 7 and going on, uh, enforces the same point. Listen, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. It's a gift, you see. It's, it's, it's something that comes entirely, it's given, it's altogether from the Holy Spirit. Again, that emphasizes this element and aspect of his sovereignty. Then we go on to a third principle, which is clearly taught in this chapter, that each Christian is given and has, therefore, some gift. That's verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man 
to profit with all. So that here there is very definite and clear teaching that this gift, that a gift is given to us each and every one. Verse 11 really says it again. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. The clear implication there is that every single Christian is given some particular gift. Indeed, it seems to me that the analogy which the apostle uses in this chapter concerning the nature of the church, this perfect analogy of the human frame, the body, of necessity carries this idea that there is a special function and a special gift to every single member of the Christian church. You notice he says some are important, some are unimportant, some comely, some, some less comely, and so on. But he says all these are necessary for the body. Some seem to be more feeble, he says, but they're essential. And every single part, however small and insignificant apparently, every one has its place and position in the body and is enabled to function by the Holy Spirit. So that from this we deduce that every member of the Christian church, I mean by that every true member of the body of Christ, every true Christian who has been baptized into the body of Christ by this one spirit has some particular spiritual gift. Then the next principle, the fourth principle taught here obviously is this, that the gifts that are given differ in value. Now there again, let me quote you some verses, verses 14 and 15. Uh, for the body is not one member, he says, uh, but, uh, but many. And then you've got it still more explicitly in verse 28. And God hath set some in the church, first, you notice, first, apostles, secondarily, prophets, thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And as I've just been saying, he does compare uh, the various parts in these words, nay, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. And so on. And he goes on to say that God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. And so on. So that there again we have this definite teaching that the gifts differ in value. But if you go on to chapter 14, you'll find he says it still more explicitly. In verse 5, for instance, I would, he says, that he all spake with tongues, but rather that he prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. And again in the famous statement in verse 19, verses 18 and 19, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my vice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. And you notice in any case, as I shall be emphasizing later, the position which he allots always to the gift of tongues in his various lists. And obviously it is done quite intentionally. Very well, there is another principle, but let us now go on to the fifth. The fifth principle is that all gifts, or any gifts, must always be used in love. Now that's the great message of the 13th chapter, isn't it? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal, and so on. This is a thing he is most concerned to emphasize. That whatever the gift is, it must be used in love. Which indeed entitles us to say this. That you should never estimate or judge a man's spirituality solely in terms of the gifts that he possesses. These two things do not always run parallel. A man may have a remarkable gift, and yet he may be failing in certain respects. 
so that you can't always equate these things. Obviously, there is teaching in Scripture which says that eventually such a man shall be deprived of his gift. But it's equally clear that for a while, a man's gift may be very much greater than his spiritual condition. And another way of putting this self-same truth is to say this. You will often find in the history of the church, and especially perhaps in the history of revivals, that God has chosen men of very small natural gifts and has given them some remarkable spiritual gift. As if to emphasize my first point and this point. So that we can never, as it were, deduce too readily about a man from the gift that he possesses. There are these other factors that have to be brought into consideration. Very well, then, all the gifts must be used in love. Ultimately, they're of no value to us, and we shall not profit by them unless we do use them in love. The gift may be used as God could use a man like Cyrus and others in the Old Testament, but it doesn't tell us anything of necessity about the state and the condition of the soul. And my last general point would be this one. That there is no gift which, uh, concerning which you have a right to say or to postulate that a Christian must possess it if he has the Holy Spirit. Now, that's rather an involved way of putting it. Let me put it in another way. There are those who would say that unless we have possessed or manifested a particular gift, that we have never been baptized by the Spirit or have never known any fullness of the Spirit. I suggest to you that any reading of these three chapters gives the lie direct to any such teaching. There is not a single gift mentioned here of which we are told that it must be present. Rather, the whole suggestion is that one has one and one another, and you never know which gift the man is going to have. But there is no universal gift, which is a sine qua non, and which must be insisted upon as being present. That seems to be teaching which is utterly unscriptural, indeed a denial, it seems to me, of the very thing that the apostle is concerned to say in this chapter, and especially in view of his elaboration of his doctrine in the analogy of the human body. Now then, then I say the things about which I think we can assume more or less general agreement, apart from certain odd persons. But now I come and I raise another problem, another question which is certainly more controversial, and especially perhaps at the present time. Are these gifts, and are all these gifts, meant for the Christian church always and at all times? What have we got here? Have we got a description here of what was true only of the early church, or is it to be equally true of the church today? What of these gifts? Were they temporary? Or are they permanent? Can you say any of these things about all of them? Or do you have to subdivide them? Now there is, as I say, a very debatable question. And you will know that there are authorities on both sides. As is invariably the case with these difficult matters. About which I suggest to you humbly that we can't arrive at uh, any finality in this world and in this life. So that with regard to this question, as with regard to so many others, dogmatism should be avoided, and we must uh, try to approach the Scriptures uh, with as little prejudice as we can, and try to consider what they teach. Now, there are certain statements, therefore, that I'd like to put to your consideration. First of all, there are certain scriptural statements which seem to me to throw light on this problem. Here is one, for instance. The apostle at the end of the second chapter of his epistle to the Ephesians, the 20th verse actually, Ephesians 2, 20th, uh, 2, 20, uh, talks about the Christian church being built upon the foundation 
of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You notice the term is the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, surely the term foundation does suggest once and for all. You lay a foundation once and once only, and then you build and erect on your foundation. You don't continue a foundation. By definition, a foundation is something that is not continued. It's laid and there it is. That's the end of the foundation. And you do things on the foundation. Now then, the apostles and prophets are the foundation, which surely and clearly suggests that they are not to be repeated, but that they were special men at the beginning and the foundation and the origin of the Christian church who are not to be repeated. Surely... It's not difficult to understand this when you come to think of it. These uh, were the men who were there to teach and to preach and to instruct the Christian people before the New Testament canon came into being, before the Gospels were written, before these epistles were written. There wasn't a New Testament. We so often tend to forget that. We, we, we don't remember that putting it almost at a minimum, there were 20 years when there were Christian people and members of Christian churches without a New Testament. And they were dependent upon this oral teaching and instruction, apostles and the prophets who were inspired and authoritative and who spoke without error. But surely once the documents had come into being, the necessity for that was no longer there. Having had the testimony and the teaching of the apostles and prophets which we have in our New Testament documents, there is the foundation and nothing further is required. So there is in that sense no necessity for apostles and prophets after the apostles and prophets who were the foundation at the beginning. And as a matter of fact, it's very interesting to observe that the early church did not claim that they were apostles and prophets. They all pointed back to them. When the church came to define the New Testament canon, the big test they always applied, you remember we saw about two years ago, was this test of apostolicity. Could a writing that was put forward be traced to an apostle, or if not to an apostle, to the influence, direct influence of an apostle? Apostolicity. They didn't claim that they were apostles. They looked back to the apostles as the authorities, a most significant fact. Now, I recommended a book some time ago, and I repeat the recommendation at this point. A book, I think you'll find it in the book room here, by a man called Geldenhuis, and the title is Supreme Authority. I recommend that book very strongly in this particular connection. It really is of great value in the whole question of the authority of Scripture. And he brings out very clearly the point I'm just making that uh, those who followed the apostles did not make this claim for themselves, but looked back to the apostles and pointed back to the apostles. Well, then, I think always that Hebrews, in the second chapter, uh, is is interesting at this point. Uh, Verses 3 and 4, you remember where we are told, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now, surely the suggestion there is this. I'm calling attention, says this man, to this great salvation, and you mustn't neglect it for certain reasons. It first began to be was spoken by the Lord himself, and it was confirmed to us by them that heard him. That's to say the apostles. God bore them witness, that's to say the apostles, with the signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. The suggestion being surely, that these particular gifts and manifestations were given to them in order to attest their apostolic authority. 
And therefore, having had that and having had their teaching as we have it here, there is no further need for such gifts. Now that seems to me to be the arguments of the second chapter of Hebrews, verses 3 and 4. There are some who would say that even the 13th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians teaches it in verse 8. We read, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Some authorities say that that means that Paul was there prophesying that these things would end. To be quite frank and honest, I can't accept that. I think he's referring to something much beyond this, to the ultimate glory, when we shall see face to face, when love alone will be left, and even faith and hope will be turned into sight. But I mention it to you because it is an argument that has commended itself to some. Very well, there are certain scriptural statements that, to put it at any rate uh, like this, suggest that these gifts were only temporal for the church at that point, speaking generally. Well, then we come on to a second point, which is this. It is really important to notice what happened after the days of the apostles. And the fact is that these gifts did disappear after the apostles. Now you can read the evidence for yourselves. You will find a number of books uh, dispute that. But if you trace back to the source, you will find that it really can be established. I have to give you this on my own word tonight. I can assure you I could give you the evidence. If you trace the sources right back, it's perfectly clear that these gifts did cease after the days of the apostles. The gifts were withdrawn. But then some people say, oh yes, we admit that. But they say, wasn't that surely due to the fact that the church became less spiritual than she was before? And isn't that the trouble today, that the church is so unspiritual that the gifts are not given and are not being manifested? To which there seems to me to be a very clear and obvious answer, which is this that the gifts, as I've been emphasizing, are bestowed by the Spirit in a sovereign manner, irrespective of us. It is his prerogative. But there is a still more powerful argument. If the argument is that low spirituality means absence of gifts, high spirituality means presence of gifts, well then, how do you think it ever came to pass that there were any gifts at all in the church at Corinth? which is surely one of the least spiritual of all the New Testament churches. There were excesses, there were abuses. Indeed, the whole state of the church uh, was in a most pathetic condition. And yet, you see, the gifts were very much in evidence there. It seems to me that this one epistle on its own is sufficient to prove uh, that uh, we must never use uh, such an argument. And furthermore, there is this argument of history you will find that revivals have generally come when things have been at a very low ebb. When uh, some of the saints had almost given up hope, then the power descended. That is why men who think that they can prepare a revival or work up a revival are so unscriptural and unhistorical. It is when everything seems to be going the other way that God visits the church with revival and with reawakening. So that again, I suggest to you that that is an important consideration as you try to come to a conclusion about this matter. Then I would add this further comment. That if we do believe that these gifts, most of them, were for the apostolic era only, it does not mean for a moment that no miracles have taken place ever since. It doesn't mean that. It means that the gift of miracles is withdrawn. Clearly, throughout the history of the church, miracles have taken place and have been performed from time to time. And to say that these particular gifts which are dealt with here were for the apostolic period only, in no sense denies the possibility of a miracle at any time or at any moment. 
For instance, if you say that the gift of healing has been withdrawn, that it was specially for this time, that doesn't mean for a second that you would have to say, therefore, that uh, no person has ever been healed as the result of the prayers of Christian people. Because there are obviously and clearly many examples and illustrations of that very thing taking place. In other words, we've got to get this thing clear in our minds that we are discussing these special gifts that were given to attest the authority of the apostles. These special gifts at the beginning but God being God, God can work a miracle whenever he likes and wherever he likes. And he can answer prayer in an unusual manner whenever he chooses to do so. So let us be clear about that in our minds. To say that the gifts were only for that period is not to deny the possibility of miracles now, nor the possibility of marvelous answers to prayer and things which clearly belong to the supernatural realm. Very well. You will see by this that my own tendency is to say that at any rate, with regard to certain of these gifts, we must say that they were temporary. But I want to go on to suggest that there are other gifts which obviously are permanent. I can't make a sweeping statement about this, say all or none, not at all. I want to try to show you that some gifts were temporary, other gifts were then, they've continued ever since, and are in evidence today. So I would suggest this subdivision. First of all, temporary gifts. What are they? Well, first and foremost, the gift of apostleship. The apostles are not repeated once and for all. So the gift necessary to make a man an apostle is no longer present. That was a temporary gift. The same applies to the gift of prophecy. What is this gift of prophecy ab about which we read in the New Testament? Well, it means two things, as it does in the Old Testament. It means a foretelling. It means a conveying of truth from God to people. It means that you become the vehicle and the channel of communicating a revelation or a teaching to people, divinely inspired to do so. And it also means foretelling. Now, it's quite clear that these New Testament prophets exercised their gift in both those respects. But as I was saying a few moments ago, that was obviously something that was necessary before we had our New Testament canon. But it is no longer necessary. And that is why we take our stand upon this position, that there has been throughout the centuries no additional revelation beyond that which we have in this book. So if any man has ever claimed at any time or does today that he's got some further revelation, we reject that claim. That is why we, uh, for instance, will not accept the authoritative claims of the Roman Catholic Church. That church claims that she has been receiving revelation exactly as the apostles and prophets did. They say that she is as inspired as they were, so that certain truth has been revealed to her since the end of the canon. That is why they've promulgated their doctrine of the Immaculate Conception and recently the Assumption of the Virgin Mary and so on. They claim, you see, that they're the continuation of the apostleship, the apostolate and that there is inspiration today as there was then. So you see the importance of having certain clear distinctions in our mind. The gift of prophecy, like the gift of apostleship, was a temporary one, and it ceased when it was no longer necessary. I would put into this same category also the gift of healing. Now don't misunderstand me again. I'm talking about the gift of healing by which I understand this, that certain of these people had been given a gift by the Holy Spirit, whereby they themselves directly could heal people. It doesn't mean that they prayed for them and that as the result of their prayers that the patient was healed. It means that they literally, actually, directly and immediately healed the patient. That's what the gift of healing means. I suggest that was a temporary gift. Now, I know that cases are reported in which people today seem to have a healing gift. 
Yes, you'll find some of them are spiritualists and some of them um, don't even claim to be spiritualists and are not Christians at all, but they've got some odd healing power. I'm not here to dispute that. I'm not here to dispute phenomena. But what I am asserting is that the Holy Spirit's gift of healing is something that ceased with the, with the apostles. And the same applies to miracles. The gift of miracles. Remember, I said just now, that miracles have taken place since. But that's a very different thing from the gift of miracles, which obviously the Apostle Peter possessed, which the Apostle Paul possessed. He could exercise it here, he could exercise it there. He was given a commission to do so, and he had the ability to do so. Now that is a gift which has disappeared. Again, the Roman Catholic Church will tell you that it still has it. But uh, we have other ideas with respect to that and other explanations as to what they put forward as supposed miracles. But I'm not disputing the possibility of a miracle. I am asserting that the gift of miracles ended with the apostles. And in the same way, the gift of discerning spirits. And in the same way with the gift of tongues. Now, let us say just a few words about this gift as it so often leads to trouble and to confusion. You are told about this gift of tongues in three chapters in the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter, the tenth chapter, and the nineteenth chapter. And then it's dealt with in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. The great question debated throughout the centuries is this. Do the three chapters in the Acts refer to the same thing as the three chapters in 1 Corinthians? Is the thing described in the Acts of the Apostles identical with the thing that was taking place in the church at Corinth? Now there are different schools of thought. There are those who say, no, these things are not the same. They say, in the book of Acts, what you had was the Apostles and others literally speaking in other languages. Not speaking in Greek or Hebrew, but perhaps uh, speaking in Latin or in some of these various dialects of those various peoples, Medes and Parthians and so on, who were gathered together at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. There, they say, it's clearly a question of using other languages. Whereas they say in Corinthians, it isn't that. It's some sort of ecstatic utterance, which isn't a language at all. But uh, the person taken up by the Holy Spirit emits sounds and languages, uh, sounds and words which he doesn't understand. And it's not really a language at all, just an ecstatic utterance. That is one and uh, perhaps the largest school of thought which would differentiate the two things from one another. But again, speaking for myself, I find it very difficult to accept that. Because I find that the terms which are used in the Acts and in 1 Corinthians are precisely the same. And it seems to me to be an unnecessary thing to postulate two different things if one will account for it all. But then the question that is asked is if you say that, but uh, we are told that these people in Jerusalem in the day of Pentecost, everyone heard these apostles speaking in their own language, of course. That seems to me to be a part of the miraculous thing that took place. In other words, I suggest to you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, these people who were listening were enabled to hear it in their own language, though their own language was not being spoken. Now, there were at least 15 different dialects spoken by those people who were present at Jerusalem at that time. You count it up and check it. Fifteen different dialects and speeches. And it seems to me to be quite incredible that if these fifteen different languages were being spoken at the same time in, this, in these conditions, that these people who were standing by and listening could each one differentiate not only his own language, but could clearly follow what was being said. It seems to me to be impossible. But here is the thing that seems to me to be quite possible that the apostles were speaking in some kind of speech and the Holy Spirit, as it were, conveyed that speech to all these people as if it were coming in their own tongue and in their own language. And they understood uh, what was being said. They understood these men telling forth these wonderful works of God. 
So that I suggest the difference between the Acts and the First Corinthians is simply this. That the thing was done in all its perfection on the day of Pentecost and in the house of Cornelius and in Ephesus. Whereas in Corinth there was this difference. That sometimes the man speaking in Corinth himself didn't know what he was saying. And sometimes nobody else did except an occasional interpreter. Apart from that one difference and distinction, I see no difference at all. As if the thing were done in all its fullness and its glory at Jerusalem, etc. But here in Corinth, the utterance was made, but the ability to understand it was not conveyed to others. Of course, it wasn't conveyed to all at Jerusalem, because there were some who thought that these men were filled with a new wine, you remember. They were not given this ability to understand. But there in Corinth you had these interpreters who were able to explain uh, what it meant. Well, very well, there are some, it seems to me, of these things which we must bear in mind. And the other points, of course, are these. That the gift of tongues is not meant for all. The apostle asks, do all speak with tongues? And the answer is, of course, no. All do not speak in tongues, all do not have the gifts of healing, all do not interpret, etc., etc. And you notice that he always puts this gift last in his lists. In chapter 14, he's at great pains to say that it all must be controlled and order, everything must be done decently and in, and in order, that God is not the author of confusion. So if you meet somebody who says that he speaks in tongues, or if you've been at a meeting where this is claimed, and if there was disorder and confusion, well, you're entitled to say, in terms of the scriptural teaching, that whatever else it may have been, it wasn't the thing described in the church at Corinth. Here, I say, is the thing that the apostle always emphasizes. The order, the control, which must be exercised. Well, I leave it at that. It's a difficult subject. But if we bear heed... Uh, constantly to the injunctions and the warnings and the teaching of the scripture uh, we shall be t saved from much trouble. Uh, just to complete this this evening, may I suggest to you a list of the permanent gifts. I shan't comment on them. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the word of teaching, the, the ability to teach, the gift of ministering and helps, the gift of administrations and governments, the ability the deacons and elders and others have and, 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 and such, such gifts. The gift of evangelism. The gift for the pastorate. The gift of exhortation. And a gift which is mentioned here, which is often a cause of confusion, the gift of faith. Did you notice that amongst these gifts is one which is mentioned as the gift of faith? And people have often stumbled at that. What's it mean? Well, the simple answer to that is this. The gift of faith mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 is obviously the kind of gift that was given to a man like George Muller or Hudson Taylor. It isn't the gift of believing in Christ because every Christian has that. Whereas every Christian has not the gift of faith mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. It's this special gift of faith that enables a man to trust God in the way those men did and others have done. And God by that means and through them manifests his glory and his power. And then may I add just one word so that we can say that this evening uh, we have come to the end of our consideration of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. It, it isn't really a part of the doctrine, but many friends are troubled by this great question and problem of what is called the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. As I say, it isn't a part of the teaching of the doctrine concerning the Holy Spirit. And yet, for the sake of helping those who may be in trouble, let me say just a word. You find that, you remember, in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. You find the corresponding places in Mark 3 and in Luke 11. Now, I can deal with this subject very, very simply. What is this blasphemy or sin against the Holy Ghost? Christian people are often troubled that they are guilty of it. The answer is this. If you are troubled about it, you can be absolutely certain that you're not guilty of it. What is it? Well, look at it as it's described in those passages. 
See it in the 6th of Hebrews and the 10th of Hebrews. See it in 1 John 5 where he says there is a sin which is unto death for which you should not pray. What's it mean? It means this. It means that a man deliberately rejects Christ and glories in his rejection of him. Perhaps even attributes the powers of Christ to Beelzebub or to a devil, as the Pharisees did. They said he's casting out devils by the prince of he's casting out devils by the prince of the devils by Beelzebub. The man, therefore, who is guilty of the sin against the Holy Ghost, not only doesn't believe in Christ, he doesn't want to believe in him. He ridicules him. He treats him with scorn and derision. He turns his back upon him and he dismisses him. So, my friend, if you are worried that you've sinned against the Holy Ghost and you want to be right with God and want to be right with Christ and feel that you've sinned yourself out of the relationship and you're moaning and groaning because you're out of the relationship and not in, not only are you not guilty of the sin against the Holy Ghost, you are as far removed from it as a person can ever be. These people are happy. They're gloating in it. They're glorying in it. They're proud of themselves. Proud of their rejection. You are the exact opposite. It grieves you. It troubles you. You'd give anything to know him and to be right with him. My dear friend, don't listen to the lie of the devil who is trying to depress you and to rob you of your joy. Turn upon him and say, my very desire to know him and to be right with him is a proof that I have not committed the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And if you do so, I can assure you, you will find deliverance. You will find peace. And the joy of the Lord and of salvation will be restored unto you. Well, we leave it at that for this evening. And now let us turn to God and thank him. We thank thee, our Heavenly Father. We thank thee again in a special way for thy word. O oh Lord our God, how we would thank thee that thou hast not left us with all these various possibilities on the one hand and on, and on the other without any light and without any guidance and instruction. O oh God, we pray thee that thou wouldest enable us to understand thy word and its teaching. Grant unto us that humility of mind, that readiness to learn and to listen. Deliver us, O God, from any party prejudice spirit, but grant that we may have but one concern, to know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, and to live to thy glory and to tell forth thy praise and to extend thy kingdom. O God, help us to see and to know that as long as our one great central concern is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot go astray. Keep us, therefore, we pray thee, from coveting gifts for the sake of gifts, but show us that more excellent way. And, O oh God, grant us all to see and to know that it is as we manifest the fruit of the Spirit that we are well-pleasing in thy sight and a testimony to those who are round and about us. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us this night and evermore. Amen.